So first a bit about uh, my company, Essen Systems. Uh, they're founded in 1988, writing development tools for computer games and um, developed independently tools for Nintendo 64s and Playstations. And in 2005, Sony realized they were better than their own, so acquired them. So they've been responsible for the programming tools used on every Sony PlayStation platform. So recently, PlayStation 3, PS Vita, and PlayStation 4. And they're based here in Bristol, with offices in Dublin and San Jose as well. So I'm going to presume you know what Agile and Continuous Integration are. OK, so both of them are aiming to make small positive steps forward rather than giant leaps into the unknown. Uh, so the upshot of that is more testing more often. So don't leave it all to the end. So embedded software and tools, I'm going to grossly lump those together as well because when you're developing tools, ultimately you end up testing the applications that you've compiled and then you end up inheriting all these problems, so real-time software, physical interfaces, etc. At some point, they're going to interact with your compiler and your tools. So I'm just going to grossly lump all those things together and see how they fit together. So this talk is about sharing experiences. Um, so we develop tools for very large game software. A lot of it is millions of lines of C++. Uh, weird combinations of template metaprogramming and other bits of the specs that I've never otherwise had to look at. Um, we make extensive use of Agile and continuous integration practices and if you come across some problems in the embedded space and this talk is about those and some ideas on how to solve them. It's very difficult to make general statements about the embedded space because it's so varied and diverse. Um, so hopefully some ideas will be useful. If not, sorry. Coffee's only 15 minutes. Okay, so Agile says deliver working software frequently. And generally in embedded systems, you'll test at the end because the hardware is expensive or there's lots of manual testing involved. So there are good economic reasons why this is often done. So you really have to get hardware permanently allocated for you uh, if you're going to be testing on every commit and code test, code test repeatedly and do bolt it down, otherwise someone will borrow it. Automating testing, you can't do that overnight. If there's a lot of manual testing, people waggling pins, um, plugging interfaces in, unplugging them, um, you can't do that overnight, but however much you do, that will buy you more time and then it will we get a kind of snowball effect. And as Dorothy Graham was saying in the first uh, conference here, you can't automate all testing. Testers, manual testers will still spot things that you're, you won't have programmed. Okay, then you program to spot it, but then that'll be another thing. So you can't get everything, but gradually automate things and you will get uh, time benefits and efficiency benefits. So unit testing. So Agile says, do unit testing. Well, my unit is doing some I.O. And to test it, I really need to drive some I.O. into my system. So what can you do about this? So the first thing is a good programming practice. Separate I.O. from logic as much as possible. This may be kind of stating the obvious or preaching to the converted. But if you don't do that, then you're trying to test messy bits of logic and, and decisions um, in a far more complicated environment than you need to. So produce test stubs. So for example, at FN we can record uh, DualShock 4 controller inputs and then play it back into a game and see if it does the same thing. So that's very useful. Also invest in a test rig. Now as Nigel was saying, they have some quite expensive test rigs there. The degree to which you do this will vary in your field. and how much is worth investing is also a decision for you, but they can be very useful. It is upfront effort, but if you're using it 10 times a day for 10 builds a day, it will pay back. And the efficiency of uh, development, and the speed you can develop will be noticeably improved. 
test-driven development. So test-driven development means you write a test, then you write your code. So a lot of the projects I've worked on are taking GCC and modifying it for a new target, or taking Linux and building a system on it. Well, you've already got a massive system. Um, and then you're just going to add functionality on top of it. So you don't have any tests. You can't write a test for Linux first, then here's Linux. So I don't feel it's a very good fit. So instead, DDT, the opposite, defect-driven testing, can be a very good way to uh, get coverage. So I'm presuming I'm not going for 100% coverage here. So with defect-driven testing, whenever you fix a bug, you add a test. So the benefit of this is bugs tend to cluster. So you write tests for the areas where your bugs are, and you have a lot more tests in those areas. Some bits will be fine. The, imagine Nigel Winting here on, on the front row. Some areas of your, of your code will be simple, probably won't have problems, may never be tested. But the areas which keep giving you problems will get more tests. So use a continuous integration server. So a lot of these are designed for Java and application development. And they don't fit well with embedded. So simple things like run this program, stop this program, are more complicated than embedded. You know, might just load code over a network. You might need to connect a debugger, have JTAG interfaces, etc. So there's a lot more that can go wrong in the way. So my best idea for this is to wrap up all of your processes so they look nice and neat, like start program, stop program, uh, handle logs, etc. So handle all the problems you might have with the embedded space in your own scripts and your own wrappers, and then just present it as a nice, neat Java or application development um, to the CI tool, and it will give you a lot more benefits. Um, the CI tools are not designed to cope with this, so don't expect them to do a good job of it. Also, handle reliability issues in the wrapper. If you have network issues or your code doesn't always load correctly, uh, wrap that to make it reliable. Also, use standard formats like JUnit, XML, uh, which tools will accept. Um, and give you a lot of payback and handle all your results nicely for you. So visibility of build and test. You'll find with continuous integration you have a lot of data, a lot of information around. And personally, I think all this should be on intranet sites rather than Excel spreadsheets and documents and things. Opinions differ on that. But a lot of C and C++ teams don't have the, the web and database skills to set up these sites. So what do you do about this? So my advice is use a modern web platform like Ruby, Django, Node.js. They're pretty easy to learn, and you can produce a useful internet site in hundreds of lines of code. Don't dive into coding raw SQL, HTML. And don't get your C++ embedded developers writing, writing sites for you like that. It's not worth it. Use the best tools you can and it'll be a lot more efficient. Keep the build fast. So uh, people recommend 10 minutes. I've worked on projects which have had like two to five hour build times. Quite painful. You can get very large C and C++ code bases uh, with handwritten make file systems, um, which have all sorts of missing dependencies in. So when you run them in parallel, it works half the time. Okay, so it sounds crazy, but you can replace the build system. The code is, should be the most important thing. If you replace it with a more modern system like CMake and Ninja, or um, CMake generating make files even, um, it's a lot easier to go for parallel and distributed builds. And the DSN, we're building large software, as I said, and this can really this can reduce build times from hours to minutes, seriously. And if you're reducing hours to minutes, days can become hours and weeks can become days very, very easily. So it's very much worth doing. 
So as I said, best practice is to check the build before you go home. If it takes three hours, that won't happen. So in embedded software, you get a lot of intermittent test results. Um, as Nigel was saying, often your software and hardware is um, developed at the same time. So you're working with pre-production hardware trying to develop your software. So it might be your problem, their problem, someone else's problem. So make sure you log everything or otherwise fail very loudly. This might be the only chance you see you get to see this bug. Might be the only time this month it goes wrong after 24 hours of running. So you want to get all the information you might need to possibly debug it. Collect warnings and static analysis. I think it should be unforgivable to spend days or weeks debugging something on an embedded system, which is not necessarily easy, if actually it could have been found by a warning or a static analysis check. Okay? Real-time issues on embedded systems can take days or weeks, I know from bitter experience. Um, and I reckon people can fix, developers can fix between 10, tens of, or hundreds of static analysis checks or warnings a day. So even if they don't exactly correlate, if you get through all your warnings and static analysis checks, you've probably fixed one or two of those days or weeks kind of bugs. Report issues to other groups, otherwise they won't know you care. So scarce hardware. If you're working on new hardware, there might be only five or ten boards globally. So you want to bolt one down and you want to keep one. How do you justify this? So one thing we find very useful at SN is we have a queue system, a kind of batch queue system for our hardware. So you just submit jobs to it. So instead of saying, oh, you're borrowing that board, you're having that board, you can just fire jobs at them uh, much more easily. And people appreciate that you're making good use of this hardware. Also, if you get more hardware later, you can parallelize all your, all your, um, all your test jobs. So that's very useful. Also, justify it by using it. If you're using test hardware for weekly test, people will think, well, most of the time that's just hanging around. If you're building and testing 10 times a day, they'll probably have to let you keep the hardware. So as I said, the embedded uh, software field is very diverse. And it's quite common that no test environment is quite right for your system. I think you just have to accept this and write your own. The important thing is do it properly. Use good software design principles to do it. Don't just mash something together and think, oh yeah, that'll be fine, because a few months later that'll be thousands of lines of stuff mashed together. So start out making it as simple as possible to write tests, and developers will. If it's simple, they will write tests. Also use good design principles from the start if you find yourself writing tests for your test software, I don't have a problem with that. And this will incur a lot of upfront development cost. So the main drawback of continuous integration is the upfront cost. This is even more so in embedded. But I think it's worthwhile, and I think that Agile and CI can be done in this space. So, thank you. Thank you. You talked about the unreliability of the hardware test bench, the test platform, and also the availability of it. What about simulation? Um, I've worked with simulations in some environments, and they're very useful. They're a lot more reliable, and they're, but they don't always have the speed. So yes, where where they're available, that's a very good alternative. That's a good point. Um, I've also worked in environments where they're not available. And so, yes, I guess the simulation could be sort of as a test rig or test environment. So yes, worth building it if you can. Do you do any random testing? And if you do, how well does it fit into the continuous integration in Agile? Um, Yes, we do do random testing. Um, I've always found random testing is, doesn't quite fit with CI tests. And I think 
uh, Dorothy Graham's talk last time, um, talking about exploratory testing or regression testing. And I think if you fit random testing more into exploratory testing, then it makes more sense. So you can just leave leave a computer running, generating tests until it finds failures. But I think I think I'd have to agree with you. It doesn't necessarily fit that well into continuous integration. Well, I'm not saying that it doesn't. I know that it does, but most people's opinion is that it doesn't. But okay. I'll talk to you after about that. That's interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Dan, did you want to? Just a point on the simulator question. The issue I find with simulators is with the I.O. You have to code something to replace the missing I.O. you get with the real hardware. Um, and that, to me, is the main reason that simulators are often not a I mean, you can mock up uh, simulated I.O., but, yeah, uh, again, there are lots of decisions that you have to make as to what's realistic and how realistic. Obviously, if you're doing rockets and things like this, then it's very different from kind of embedded and consumer applications. But. Yeah, hi. Um, I was quite surprised you, you were talking about um, writing your own web server to produce the uh, test results um, for the running tests. Um, doesn't, uh, I would expect the, um, the web interface to come with the continuous integration server. So what I, that depends on the continuous integration system. Some have um, a lot more uh, presentation of results than others, but I've always found that there's something they don't do or there's some other information that's unique to what I've been doing that I want to write a website for. Um, so it depends on the, the system. Sometimes you might want to improve it. So say Jenkins, you've got um, Java plugins for it. If you want to write a plugin and you're all C and C++ developers, then you don't necessarily know. You don't necessarily have the right skills. For that. So yes, they do a lot, but if you want to go further, 